God. Bullets dropping in the living sin, evil incarnate, manipulating hatred and creating an arms race. And don't nobody in here want to step to the boss. I got my boy Nib Mizzy in here pouring the sauce. Man, what you know about real power? What's up, my wizards? It's Dev SBMTG down there on your screen. We like it a magic, and today I'm going to bring you maybe the weirdest Grixis list I've ever brought you. That's right, just fair warning so you know what you're getting into. This is not the Grixis control list that plays counter spells and search for his Kanta, nor is it the Grixis mid-range list that curves like Thief of Sanity and Legion Warboss into a bolus. Those lists have been done to death. I profiled both of those lists in the last season or two on the channel, and it would feel kind of lazy of me just to do those lists again because they haven't really changed that much. So instead, it's time for something completely different and way out of left field. And usually, I agonize over these kind of decks. You can kind of see that in the Five Color Gates deck I just uploaded the other day. I knew that deck wasn't going to get the best reaction, so I'm kind of sweating through it, you know. But this time, even though this deck is very different and I'm not sure it's going to get the best reaction, I'm, I slept like a baby last night knowing that this is the deck I was going to present because it works and it's really, really neat and there's a lot of different like little synergies. So it's a perfect SBMTG deck. Let's go ahead and get to it. And remember to like and subscribe, blah blah YouTube stuff. But anyway, one of the reasons this deck is so different is because it's basically based around Electro Dominance. It's one of my favorite cards from Ravnica Allegiance, and I have made no secret about that. I've freaked out about this card on the channel and on Twitter a couple of times before. There's just so many cool things you can do with it. Just to clear this up, finally, this won't be the last time I have to clear this up because people will always be like, no, you can't. But yeah, you can cast things at instant speed with this that you normally wouldn't be able to cast. This basically ignores time restrictions on anything you're playing with it for free so you can cast sorceries creatures and planeswalkers and stuff at instant speed say during your opponent's combat step or then your opponent's in step as long as you electro dominance them into play this opens us up to like so many like tricks yeah cute stuff we can do we'll get to that but just powerful plays in general it doesn't even have to be a cute trick you know during your opponent's combat step busting up one of the biggest guys on their side of the board and then dropping a nickel bolus to block one of their guys is just a supercharged play that's going to swing the game for you. So even if you're not doing cute stuff with Electro Dominance, there's still plenty of ridiculous plays this opens up, especially if you can make it to the late game. But in the meantime, this can just be a pretty effective removal spell on occasion. You know, kill a small to medium guy, drop a small to medium thing. Don't be afraid to use it that way. But obviously in the late game, this can be a straight up win condition. You'd be surprised how often it is. Let's get on to all the stuff that we hope to be able to drop at instant speed via Electro Dominance, and most of these are creatures that are already really, really good in standard. That's one of my favorite things about this deck, is we don't have to resort to, like, bad stuff. <laughs> you know, we're playing creatures that are already dominating forces in standard, and sometimes we get the option to play them at instant speed, which just makes them all that much better. Like Niv-Mizzet Perrin. It costs a total of 8 mana to actually drop this with Electro Dominance, but you'll get there more often than you might think. We'll talk about that a little bit later and how you might expect to do that. That. But obviously, Niv Mizzy is just a good card to drop. Even if you don't drop him at instant speed, you just get your six mana and you drop Niv Mizzy and you're living a pretty good life. Now, I love having a piece that's this good against control in the main deck, and it's not the only one, by the way. Niv Mizzet is a beast against not only control, but a lot of the other decks in the format, where if you drop him against a mid range deck, he still usually spells Doom for them, and we've got tons of instants and sorceries to make sure that we can keep drawing cards and doing a little bit of extra damage, too. You know, if you drop a niv Mizzet or any other creature at the end of your opponent's turn, you pretty much immediately untap, and the creature gets over summoning sickness. So again, an effective form of haste on a creature like niv Mizzy just makes him that much better. We're also playing two copies of Nikki B. The Ravager, a must-play for the deck, obviously. Like, just like niv Miz, this is another card that's good on curve. On your turn, at normal speed, make them discard. That's relevant against the glut of mid-range control decks in the format. Discard is extremely relevant. Um, and a, a big juicy flying body is a nice threat against him a lot of the time too, but if you actually electrify this, boogie, woogie, woogie, it only costs 6 mana, which sounds, that sounds crazy, right? It only costs 6 mana, but you'd be surprised again how often you'll get there in this deck. And we've got a couple of different ways of generating mana, kind of ramping a little bit. And um, so it makes it really easy to electrify this for only 6 mana, and flip it over for that matter, which usually ends up in a game win. And the ability to wait to play it at instant speed with Electro Dominance usually makes it way easier to actually transform this card. So it's just that much better in this deck. God status, once you do get him flipped over, that's a game win. But sometimes you don't even have to flip him over. We're actually playing another four mana flyer in this deck. Because I think we have to devote a couple of copies to Crackling Drake. Just a beast in standard by itself. I think the argument can be made that Izzet's Drakes is still the best deck in the format. All things considered, it's still an amazing deck. And that's due in large part, obviously, to Crackling Drake, the real Drake. 
But um, in this deck, we have the ability to play this card at instant speed on occasion. And like I said earlier, that gives us the ability to put a functional form of haste on our creatures. You know, we can play them at the end of our opponent's turn, basically immediately untap and attack with them. So the ability to have like an 8 to 10 power haste flyer effectively that also clears part of the board off or deals extra damage to your opponent via electro dominance, that is absolutely freaking lutely nuts and if you can actually catch your opponent flat-footed tapped out and do and play this at the end of their turn it's just basically curtains for them because this is just going to do all the damage to them as soon as you hit your next attack step we're also playing one copy of ral in the deck and i'd probably play this again just like all the other creatures i'd probably play this even if we weren't playing dominance but given that we can play this at the end of our opponent's turn it's even more worth a slot than usual. You know, it's basically a removal spell sometimes. It can cast Beacon Bolt if you minus him, and that can kill really big stuff in the mid and late game, bigger than some of our other spells can kill. So that's an important thing, but also just the card advantage inherent in this is important to us too. So I'm just going to sneak in one copy of Ral. I don't think he's that important, but in a deck that has the ability to play him at instant speed, he's a little bit better, so I think he's worth the slot. But on to one of our secret weapons here, the Mirari Conjecture. Just a couple of copies of this. There's actually a lot of two-ups. That's one thing this has in common with a lot of Grixis control lists. <laughs> a lot of two-ups. <laughs> but we don't need a bunch of copies of Mirari Conjecture, but I absolutely freak out, love the way it works with Electro Dominance. In case you're not hip to this yet, if you flash this into play with an Electro Dominance, at the end of your opponent's turn, you immediately hit Chapter 1 and can return Electro Dominance to your hand, still at the end of your opponent's turn. And when you go untap draw, you immediately hit chapter two and can return a sorcery. So, card is nuts. Sometimes in the late game, this is the easiest way to make Electro Dominance a win condition because you'll cast Electro Dominance for at least X equals five, hit them in the face for five, get your Electro Dominance back, and then on the next turn, you can immediately just hit them for five again or whatever, you know? So, very often, this leads to these huge Electro Dominance plays where you either, like, kill a creature or two or hit them in the face for this huge amount of damage because you're able to cast Electro Dominance twice. And, note that if you copy Electro Dominance with the third chapter of this, you'll get all the damage and you'll be able to cast two cards for free. So, that's another way of ending the game pretty easily with ED and Mirari Conjecture. But I know what you're thinking, and you've been thinking it the entire video. How are we getting all of this mana, Dev? Are you a crazy person? <laughs> you want to pay eight mana to Electro Dominance niv Mizzet? You want to cast niv Mizzet in the first place even without Electro Dominance? You, know? you want to pay seven mana for Mirari Conjecture plus ED? Yeah, that's a ridiculous play, but it's seven mana. Well, yeah, we have ways. We have ways, ladies and gentlemen. We're playing three copies of Azor's Gateway, yet believe it or not, and a copy of Treasure Map. Now, at first, I was just playing four copies of Treasure Map in this slot. I'm going to keep it real with you, and that works pretty well. For all intents and purposes, you know, that gets you a bunch of mana in the long run, plus scries and drawn cards when you need them. So Treasure Map worked really well, and I've kept one copy to avoid playing all four copies of a legendary artifact. But that said, if you do get extra copies of Azor's Gateway in your hand, you can just cycle them to Azor's Gateway, and that counts towards flipping Azor's Gateway. So you can just always feed extra copies of Gateway to itself if you've got one in play, sort of mitigating the legendary drawback on it. But that said, there's so much to like about Azor's Gateway in this deck. It counts as drawing cards for Niv-Mizzet, so it allows you to deal extra damage. That's kind of important. But also note that in this deck, exiled cards aren't necessarily lost forever. If we exile an instant or sorcery, they'll still count towards both Ral and Crackling Drake. So that's really, really relevant and a neat little piece of synergy to keep in mind. And they'll just immediately, once you flip over a gateway especially, allow you to cast all of the best things in your deck. You know, a huge Electro Dominance, play something crazy for free. And it might take until a little bit later in the game. But again, especially in the mid-range sort of control -y format that we're in, an extra piece that draws cards and allows us to ramp into our best pieces is exactly what we need. And the extra synergy, I think, makes it really worth playing over just Treasure Map. So now, obviously, the deck has kind of taken a hard left turn. So much so that Ziggy got scared. I had to hug him. But anyway, we have to kind of justify playing Azor's Gateway in the deck. We have to make certain deck building concessions to make sure that we have a bunch of different cards at different casting costs that we can feed to it that we don't necessarily mind feeding to it. Now, I think there's actually a pretty elegant solution to that. We're going to play four copies of Discovery Dispersal and four copies of Bedeck Bedazzle. Now, the coolest thing about the inclusion of these two cards is that for the purposes of Azor's Gateway, Dis and Dis counts as a 7-mana card, and Bed Bed counts as an 8-mana card, and you don't mind playing these at all, you know? Bedeck Bedazzle looks like a weird inclusion, but it's actually a great instant speed removal piece right now, and 
Also note that it can boost a Nicol Bolas, a Niv-Mizzet, a Crackling Drake without killing any of those creatures. So this is just a way to speed up a clock occasionally out of nowhere. Like for Crackling Drake, this is basically a plus four bonus without actually killing it. So if you just use this as a combat trick or a pump spell some of the time, that is also fine. It's just really, really versatile. As far as Bedazzle goes, you really won't ever choose to razzle-dazzle somebody. It's very, very few and far between that you'll actually do that. But you do have the option to if you want. Now, back to Discovery Dispersal. One cool thing to note about this is that this is both an instant and a sorcery, so it works well in a couple of different ways with the Marari Conjecture. You can bring it back during the Instant Speed Chapter 1, you know, or you can bring it back during Chapter 2 as a sorcery, so just another little wrinkle of versatility in this split card. But obviously, Discovery is great in the early game to help you draw cards. Once you have a Niv-Mizzet out, it actually does damage, and there's nothing wrong with that, and draws you an extra card while you're at it, so I like that. But Dispersal is removal, just another effective removal piece in the deck that can sometimes, you know, flush out Carnage Tyrants and stuff like that. So this is just a fine card on its own. Again, you don't have to justify playing dis dis too much in just about any deck with Blue and Black, but it gets even better in this deck. We supercharge it with some little synergies that make it an even better card. Same thing with Bedeck Bedazzle. You don't see this in too many lists, but again, Bedeck is a good enough removal piece to play. You've got an extra option in Bedazzle, and it's an 8-minute card for Azor's Gateway, so I think it's perfect to play for this deck. But that's not all the removal here. We're also playing a couple of copies of Bedevil and a couple of copies of Lava Coil. I still think it's important to play multiple, like, 2-mana removal spells in a deck that's trying to keep the board relatively clear in the early game, you know? So I'm going to play not only Bedeck, but also Lava Coil, because we need another answer, especially to cards like Rekindling Phoenix, but even to stuff like Wild Growth Walker. It's nice to have six different options that can take out these problem early creatures. As far as Bedevil, though, this can take out anything, no matter how big it gets at any point of the game, uh, unless it has Hexproof, obviously. <laughs> it's just important to have a spell like that, and it keeps us off of having to play Vraska's Contempt in an already clogged four-drop slot. You know, this is another answer to kill Planeswalkers, and that's very much welcome in a format where we see Teferis and Vivian Reeds and all kinds of stuff. Now, we're getting close to the end of the main deck here, but I still haven't told you one of the best reasons to play Grixis, or Esper for that matter, in this meta right now, and that's Thought Erasure. I have gone on and on about this card in the last few deck techs that have been able to play it, but that's for good reason. I honestly think Thought Erasure is one of the best cards in the format right now. You know, this answers a bunch of stuff in Control. You know, it's just an anti-control card in the main deck. There's nothing wrong with that. We've got plenty of those, so we've actually got pretty good Game 1 and Game 2 and 3 action against Control decks, and that's kind of an important position to be in right now in this format. But Thought Erasure is also great against Hydroid Crisis, which is kind of the other most important strategy <laughs> in Standard right now, is just play the biggest Crisis you can, you know. So this is a great tool against it. It's one of the only, like, proactive measures that can actually take out Hydroid Crisis before they get any cards or life off of it. So Thought Erasure is just really better positioned than it's kind of ever been right now. And if we're going to play Grixis, you definitely play it. Plus note that it's a sorcery for the Mirari Conjecture. Nothing wrong with that. If you get extra copy copies of it in the late game, you can just feed it to Azor's Gateway if your opponent's out of cards or something, you know, it's not relevant in the late game. Just feed it to a Gateway, draw a card, and you'll have a two-mana card in exile to count towards flipping Gateway. So there's a lot of extra stuff you can do with Thought Erasure in this deck, yeah, but mostly, mostly, it's just one of the best cards in Standard right now. I don't know how else to put it. But we'll finish the deck off with just one copy of Expansion Explosion, and <laughs> Honestly, I want to play two copies in the deck and just have five ridiculous X spells. You know, if we can get to the later-ish game, then this card is just nuts. It can also be copied with Mirari Conjecture, by the way, on Chapter 3, and that can lead to fairly easy, very late-game wins as well. But this card is just dope. Even though we're mostly building this deck around Electro Dominance, we still got to at least make room for the granddaddy crazy X spell in Standard right now. <laughs> you know, this is just a game winner um, nine times out of ten. Um, even if it doesn't win the game, it goes really well with the Niv-Mizzet. You know, you basically double the damage output with the Niv-Mizzet and draw an extra card off of it, so that's extreme. <laughs> you know? So just, it, I just, I don't, I can't think of a good reason to not include this card. Plus, if you ever absolutely have to feed it to Azor's Gateway, I don't recommend it, but it's a six-mana card, effectively, to feed to Azor's Gateway. It's a counterspell, kind of, you know, if your opponent's trying to counter something of yours, just copy their counterspell with the first half. So this also has a lot of versatility in, you know, on both halves. Um, it's a game winner. It's a, sometimes just a four for one that kills an opposing creature and draws you a bunch of cards. So again, this just, the card is too good to not include in the deck somewhere. 
Let's check out the mana base. And it's actually not too hard to build a Grixis mana base right now. We've got 18 blue sources, 16 black sources, and 14 red sources. Just enough to get to a six or seven turn div visit. And plus, we have Azor's Gateway and Treasure Map to help us with the mana in that case. So it's not really too tough to cast some of these cards. Now, we are playing pretty much all of the you know, shock lands except for one Blood Crypt. And the song remains the same as far as check lands. All of them except for one Dragon Skull Summit. But we do make room for a couple of basics in the deck, two swamps and two islands to round out our sources, and give us important untapped sources. Now here's the sideboard, and we are really improving our game against Control. We already have good game against it, but we just tear apart most Esper decks that we come across. It's one of our best matchups, because in game two and three we get Duress, we get Negate, we get Disdainful Stroke, and a couple of other cards. Eldest Reborn? You'll very often see this in sideboards and even main decks of Grixis decks and Esper decks because it's just one of the better late game pieces in the entire format. And in this deck, we have the luxury of being able to occasionally play at an instant speed, which is a pretty big game. <laughs> Same thing with Angrath. This is good against pretty much everything. I really want to port this over to the main deck, but I'm not sure what to take out here. Uh, but this is great against control because of the plus ability. It's decent against mid-range and aggro because of the minus ability. And for what it's worth, the ultimate often kills decks in the late game, so it's not a bad card. Star of Extinction, great against Sultai and other mid-range decks in the format. We've also got another copy of Bedevil in there against mid-range decks and decks that play Planeswalkers. Plus two Ritual of Soot to have a sweeper against the aggro decks. I might want to... Could, you might want to consider... <laughs> Both of us might want to consider playing Cry of Carnarium or another Sweeper in this board because we need a little bit better game against aggro. We want to extend the game as much as possible, obviously. So I could see playing another Small Ball Sweeper in here, but Sideboard's been working pretty well for me. Now here are your power rankings right here. Final score of 65. It's a really competitive score, but there are a couple of categories, you know, kind of dragging us down. We don't have all the offense in the world, and we're obviously not a very fast deck. We rely on a lot of late game interactions, but that said, we grind with the best of them. Sun, we draw a bunch of cards in this deck, and Mirari Conjecture, especially along with Electro Dominance, is an incredible grind engine. That leads to a high resiliency score, the fact that we have such good, proper late game, but we have to get there. Probably the worst matchup for the deck is the aforementioned mono-red aggro decks, or even the burn decks. We do a little bit better against burn, especially in games two and three, but we have some problems against really fast, dedicated, like, mono-white or mono-red aggro decks, or the Boris decks, so I wouldn't necessarily call this the absolute best arena deck, especially for best of one. We have a lot of good sideboard action. Note that this is one of the rare decks that does just as good after boards as it does in game one, and you can honestly make a case this does much better after boards, especially against control and mid-range decks. So if that's what you're mostly facing off against, give this thing a try. I know it looks really, really weird, and it's got a bunch of strange cards in it, but that also leads to a high degree of versatility. You know, we have Bedeck Bedazzle and Discovery Dispersal. That gives us four different spells on two cards right there, plus Expansion Explosion, which is effectively two spells too, you know? All of our creatures can either be played naturally or at instant speed, another degree of versatility. There's a lot of different things that we can do in this deck, a lot of different turn sequences, a lot of different styles of play we can adopt. If we need to curve out and play, you know, Nicol Bolas into an eventual Niv-Mizzet all on our turn, we can play that game of magic. But if we have to mostly rely on instant speed and wait to pounce when our opponent's tapped out, we can do that too. So that leads to an extremely high versatility, and I really like that about this deck. Grixis has a lot of tools in its box right now, and this deck has a lot of different ways it can be built. I'm not saying this is absolutely the best. Maybe Grixis Grixis control is the best. Maybe even tap out Grixis midrange is the best, but I've had a high degree of fun <laughs> with this deck, and all the different little, you know, layers of synergy are really, really nice, especially when they come together. And that's why, like I said, slept like a baby last night, knowing that this is the deck I was going to bring you. You know, sometimes I sweat these decks that are way, way different, but in a way, that's one of the reasons this channel exists, is to bring you decks you don't see anywhere else. And, you know, Grixis midrange, Grixis, Grixis control are really cool, and I know that there's, you know, Grixis fam out there, Grixis gang is out there, uh, and I don't want him to come for me, but I just really wanted to bring you something weird and different and you haven't seen before. And that still wins. This is still a, v a very workable deck with tons and tons of tricks up its sleeve. So hope you try this thing out, and if you're interested in doing that, click the first link in the description. Go over to my friends at Tasty Tasty Cheap Play. <laughs> They sponsor my content. They're good to you, boy. So click on the link in the description if you want to purchase any of these pieces or just see the entire deck list in kind of a more cohesive form than a fat guy rambling for 20 minutes. So check them out. Helps the channel out when you just click the link. But make sure you do all the other stuff that I told you to do at the beginning of the video. 
And I'm going to tell you in a sort of more drawn out form now, but don't, don't go anywhere. It's important to me that you stay. Help my watch time out, dog. But, you know, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, do all that stuff. If you join Patreon at just the $1 tier, then you can help vote on what decks we want to even do on this channel. So you can affect YouTube history, friend. <laughs> if you just throw a dollar in the pot every month, link in the description for that. Also, if you want to see this deck in action or pretty much any deck that I've done this season, remember to check out Sideboard MTG. Just pimped him in the last video, but I'm going to try to pimp him a little bit more often because I don't get the time or the chance or the money <laughs> to play every single one of these decks on MTGO or especially a Arena. That's very expensive. A lot of this I just do, you know, proxies and gauntlets and stuff like the old-fashioned way. You know, I use a notebook still. So, you know, if you actually want to see these decks in action from someone that does that, then check out the Sideboards channel, Leave a Living. I'll leave, huh, I'll leave a link in the description to do just that. How many times have I said I'll leave a link in the description? You'd think I'd be able to say it by now, but... Still get tongue-tied, <laughs> in any case. I'm pretty sure that's all I got for now. Make sure you let me know how you feel about this weird thing down there in the comments section. Um, I'm, I agree, there are probably ways that we could have done this quote-unquote better. You just play like Search for Escanto and a bunch of instants. No, no, yeah, we've seen it, <laughs> it's my point. But anyway, just let me know how you felt about it down there. And if you've gotten a chance to try the deck out, I want to know your experience. But in any case, I guess I'm done. I'll catch you cats later. <laughs> I'm done from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love. And be kind. God, bullets dropping in the living sin, evil incarnate, manipulating hatred and creating an arms race. And don't nobody in here wanna step to the boss. I got my boy Nib Mizzy in here pouring the sauce. Man, what you know about real power? Don't you know how to genuflect? I'ma teach you how to power and cower. You need to learn, you flounder, and I'm frightened. But you would've known by now, but you never was a bright one. 